All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, I'd like to formally introduce Carla now. Um, she, she's again the Jacqueline E. and Ellen E. Coker, MD, Distinguished Professor of Ophthalmology, the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at Washington University School of Medicine. <clears throat> she, excuse me, she completed her medical school training at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, integrated undergraduate graduate program and internship in internal medicine at Washington University. Following a residency in ophthalmology at the University of Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary in Chicago, she completed a glaucoma fellowship at Northwestern. She then returned to her home of St. Louis and served on faculty at WashU since 1994, training numerous fellows and residents and holding both residency and fellowship program directorships positions for several years. She manages a busy clinical practice as well as her research endeavors in the clinic and laboratory and she serves as the Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Professionalism for the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. As a glaucoma clinician managing complex tertiary consultations, she strongly believes in the importance of the physician-patient relationship and the impact of patient education and comprehensive disease and treatment options. Her research focus is ocular oxygen metabolism and the racial disparities in open ankle glaucoma with support from the National Eye Institute Glaucoma Research Foundation and Research to Prevent Blindness. She has also participated in several clinical studies, including the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study. She's published over 50 peer reviewed articles and 20 other reviews and book chapters. Been invited to and perform numerous visiting professorships all around the world. Uh, she's contributed to numerous committees of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Glaucoma Society, and is currently serving as vice chairperson of the Ethics Committee at, at the AAO. She has received the Secretariat and Senior Achievement Awards from the AAO for her dedicated efforts and was also inducted into the American Ophthalmological Society in 2019. And she also received the Glaucoma Research Foundation Schaefer Grant in 2016, the year before Rick received it. Um, she will be discussing today uh, pathological alterations in the trabecular meshwork no, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was one of her grants. Um, she will be presenting today a ethical introduction to new technologies in ophthalmic practice, past, present, and future. Carla, welcome. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and uh, um, bringing me back today um, since we uh, were, were having to cancel last year um, <laughs> in March, and now here we are again um, virtually in uh, May. But thank you very much. I hope someday to come to Rochester and visit all of you. Anytime. It's been a great uh, afternoon. I've really enjoyed the presentations um, from Dr. Libby and, and the uh, residents. Um, it's just been terrific. Uh, so this is gonna be something a little bit different. And uh, I hope you all uh, uh, learn from this. Uh, I have my slides up and uh, we will begin the presentation. So, uh, today we're going to talk about a little bit of ethics. Um, I, I can't help it, but I'm going to put on my ethics hat. We'll definitely have some glaucoma involvement, and uh, and please feel free to jump in. But there will be time for questions at the end as well. Um, yes, we're supposed to attend a conference on business casual ethics today, and I have no uh, financial conflicts to disclose. So we're going to talk about learn, how to learn new technologies, the informed consent process, uh, advertising claims for new technologies, and even a little bit about the process of device recalls when our new technologies don't work so well. All of this is important because we have an obligation to be truthful to our patients. It engenders patient trust, develops patient autonomy, and upholds the integrity of our profession. So the code of ethics, which all of us sign off on every year when we renew our membership to the academy, has a primary purpose to protect the individual patient, to educate all of us by defining those behaviors that we all consider to be ethical. People talk about morals and ethics and, and what's the difference? Can we really teach people morals? Well, we really can't teach morals and we certainly can't abide by any specific morals. Morals are, are, are generated in us by our parents and through our upbringing, but we can learn to be ethical. 
because there are specific behaviors which are listed in our code of ethics, for example, that we consider to be appropriate. And finally, part of what we do uh, is to adjudicate, unfortunately, when there are ethics challenges against any of our members. So there are three parts of the code of ethics, the principles, which are highly aspirational and inspirational, but those are not enforceable. But the rules, the 18, currently the 18 rules of the code of ethics are enforceable. And there's also um, very clear legalese in terms of the administrative procedures of the code, how we investigate the appeals process and ultimately sanctions. These are the 18 rules of the code of ethics. The first 13 were original um, and that was um, at the time of the inception of the committee back in 1983-84. Um, the last rule the, on harassment and discrimination was approved by the Academy membership just last year. So, in, and as I mentioned, education is really the most prominent um, issue uh, for the ethics committee. And we do that at our annual meeting programs um, the BET ethics education program where we provide lectures for state societies, um, regional um, societies, as well as residency programs. And finally, um, online through the Redmond Ethics Center. Uh, we administer the code through case reviews. I get approximately a case or two a month to review. Um, and some of these will lead to very um, detailed investigations and always in uh, fairness and due process. Um, the Redmond Ethics Center website is listed at the bottom and I'll show that again in my final slide. So as we turn to understanding new technology and ophthalmology, there's been a rapid development over decades, um, constantly expanding and advancing our techniques. If we think about what we did 20 or 30 years ago, it's very different today. And we all desire to stay on the cutting edge of care. Um, we assimilate new modifications with some familiar techniques, but sometimes we may need to develop new skills that require formal study to achieve competence. As we think about the learning curve for new technologies, what are the ethical and practical concepts of learning a new procedure? And what are our responsibilities to our patients, our colleagues, and ourselves as we learn these new technologies? So if we think about a learning curve of our trainees, um, there's a huge learning curve in our residency training. And this is under very careful supervision by those of, with experience. So if you look here in the upper graph, the mean adjusted FACO time in minutes, how it decreases significantly over time as we accumulate more surgical experience, and as well as the risk of complications of posterior capsular tear and vitreous loss over time decreasing. Amongst non-trainees, that is those who have already completed their training, we still have lifelong learning, which is essential for growth of our profession and benefits both ophthalmologists in general and our, and our patients. So we must be competent. And as long as a trainee is under supervision by someone who is competent, they should be able to assist with procedures. Knowing what is going on before you go into the operating room is critical both in terms of knowledge about the procedure and practice coming before coming to the operating room. So let's take an example of cataract surgery, the most commonly performed surgery in our field. It's a very delicate microscopic surgery. We know that there's very little space between disaster and success as the posterior capsule is only two to four microns thick. Nowadays, our patients are awake. We don't have, for, for say, the luxury of a patient under general anesthesia where we can take our time and slowly discuss the steps of a surgical procedure. Patients are awake and very aware of what's going on. Patient expectations are also extremely high nowadays with expected perfect results, very rapidly, glasses independence, and 
nearly no recovery time. We have patients now in the recovery area who are questioning why things aren't perfectly clear. I recall in, during my training when we would tell patients it will be three months before we cut all the sutures and they're ready for their final refraction. So things have really changed over a couple of decades. There's also been a paradigm shift in teaching and the old adage, see one, do one, teach one is certainly no longer applicable. The Dreyfus model where we, where we see acquisition of skills through instruction and careful practice through different stages from novice to expert. And this leads to steps to success with defined stages of learning, setting expectations, providing resources, and that back and forth of documenting progression, measuring progression, and that immediate feedback after the surgery. It's very, very important. So let's take a case study. Um, a 62-year-old gentleman who presents to a large teaching institution such as your own with a history of successful cataract surgery in the fellow eye by a community surgeon. He now presents with a visually significant cataract, no complex pathology, probably doesn't quite look like this mature cataract in the image shown here. Could this be a perfect case for a first or second year resident? Well, the resident examines the patient, the attending follows up and asks if the patient understands the procedure and if he has any questions. The patient replies, who will perform his surgery? I watch Gray's Anatomy, and having a resident operate on me makes me very nervous. He then asks if he will see 2020 postoperatively if the resident performs the surgery. Again, these high and likely inappropriate expectations. So I, I don't know if we can actually open this up for discussion, so I'll kind of answer some of these questions, but if anybody wants to jump in, they're welcome to. Is it ethical to expose patients to learning curve risks? Inevitably, we are all learners at some point in our career. I had my first cataract extraction. I did my first trabeculectomy at some point. I remember them both very vividly. But was it appropriate to expose patients to potentially greater risk as I was learning? I feel very strongly the answer is yes. We all have to learn. We all have to take those steps. And our surgical inexperience, if appropriately exposed to patients in the context of the fact that there's an attending sitting right next to you, making sure that everything goes as well as possible. And so therefore we take on the complication rate of our attending and we may disclose that appropriately to patients. Is there a public private double standard? So do those out in private practice, patients that is who are having surgery out in the private sector, are they getting better care? I venture to say no. I think our patients get very personalized care and overall are very happy with the fact that they're managed by trainees. Some question whether all patients understand what a teaching institution is, that there will be fellows and residents that will participate in the surgical process. Well, they're participating in care from day one, from the time that a patient comes into the office. So although it may not be clear to patients, it should be explained through the consent process. Um, appropriate patient selection is very important. Um, patients, um, have different expectations. And if I have a patient who says, hey doc, I only want you to do the surgery, that's what will happen. I don't change what happens. We don't have um, patients uh, you know, under sedation or anesthesia that something else happens. If that's what they say to me, that's what happens. And I, there's other teaching institutions where they will not treat patients who make those sorts of declarations. I feel that everyone has the right to the care that they desire. And I will not say to a patient, sorry, this is a teaching institution. Uh, you must have a, a resident or fellow do your surgery. That's not how I look at it. 
and appropriate anesthesia selection. Perhaps topical anesthesia is not appropriate for a resident's first several cases um, because the cases may take a bit longer. That's fine, that's acceptable. And so maybe a, a little sub tenons injection will help the patient be a little bit more comfortable. They can get a bit more sedation because we'll have control of the eye. I tape every head for surgery, unless I'm doing a, a, an angle procedure where I need to turn the head. So it's important to have control over the things that you can have control over. So informed consent, tell the patient what your training has been and don't exaggerate. Disclose how many cases you've done. You know, is it appropriate to say, well, this is my second case. Say, this is one of my first, and then you will be covered appropriately, in my opinion. It's okay to say that your complication rate will be similar to that of your mentor who is there in the operating room with you. And offer to arrange a second opinion, if necessary, if the patient requests. All patients deserve to know who's the primary surgeon that will perform the surgery. And even in a teaching hospital, Patients are entitled to specify that the attending will be the primary surgeon, as I mentioned a few moments ago. And if it can't be resolved, assign someone else to the patient. What about learning curves of those of us who have completed our training? Well, both patients and physicians are generally comfortable with us learning surgical skills under competent supervision. And it's one thing to have a resident with an attending helping along with that learning curve. But after residency, what about how we assimilate new techniques and how do we bear the responsibility for managing our own learning curve while also protecting patients' interests? So let's take another case of a gentleman, 77 years old with moderate stage open angle glaucoma, Tmax in the upper 20s to 30 range, thick cornea at 600 microns, on two classes of medication, status post SLT, with now pressure in the upper teens to 20 range. Open angles, moderate pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork, a stable um, visual field defect, um, a nasal step in the right eye, and an early arcuate in the left. No change in the nerve fiber layer for the last five years. Again, stable visual fields as well now with complaints consistent with a visually significant cataract. Could this be a perfect case for your first FACO MIGS procedure? Maybe, maybe not. So as mentioned earlier, we have rapidly developing technology and as it evolves, new surgical techniques are frequently introduced. And for those of us who are experienced, we have to assimilate new modifications of familiar techniques or may even require diff totally different skills for new techniques. The advisory, this is an advisory opinion of the Code of Ethics, and there are several advisory opinions out there, and they help to explain how to understand certain issues. And this advisory opinion is about um, learning new techniques following residency with a focus on two rules, competence and informed consent. And this is a quote from uh, this uh, advisory opinion. This creates a dilemma for the experienced ophthalmologist, whether to incorporate the newer technique or to refer the patient. We must consider if this is in his or her professional interests because it may result in stress or in even practice disruption. So how do we learn new techniques ethically? Here on the right is an image of an extracapsular cataract extraction of a very dense nuclear cataract. I'm not that old, I've been around a long time, but this was the technique of cataract extraction during my residency training. And within my training, my attendings learned to do FACO. It was painful to watch at times. I couldn't do any better, but it was painful to watch their learning curve. And as I went through my learning curve, during my residency training, which was an optimal time, in my opinion, to really learn both techniques well, I could see that this was really challenging for them because the techniques are very different. So you have to decide if you want to learn the new technique. And at first, some of my attendings were very hesitant to proceed with fake emulsification 
They were outstanding extra cap cataract surgeons. But when a new technique is shown to be superior and it didn't take too long to see that FACO was superior than, to extra cap and that the benefit of the patient must be considered, it was important to, uh, to incorporate these new techniques into our practices. And if you couldn't do it or did not want to learn to do it, to refer to a colleague. And the care of the patient must be foremost. So considering that this really impacted their career, I mean, they had to learn these new procedures and there was quite a bit of stress involved and certainly a learning curve. So once you decide you want to learn a new technique, you have to commit to formal study and it depends on how much it is different from your known techniques. Courses at the academy or other specialty meetings with sealed transfer sessions and labs, um, surgical stimulators, and assistance of a skilled mentor may be very appropriate. And reviewing initial cases, now that we have video, we can review those initial cases with a more experienced mentor. It's important to research the procedure and the steps that are needed to incorporate it into your practice. It might require certification, um, asking the manufacturer's rep um, to be present for a certain number of cases, and be very careful as you select patients, perform preoperative evaluations, um, and prepare for the case preoperatively as well. Be familiar with the instruments. Um, it's so important that you held them in your hand, that you looked at them under the microscope, and that you really understand how you're going to utilize them. Um, develop those surgical skills and also learn about what complications may occur, both intraoperatively and postoperatively. Rule one, competence. We have an obligation to provide our patients with the highest quality care possible. Although a learning curve is necessary while acquiring these new skills, we must do all the things as I mentioned before to learn about the procedure and its outcomes beside, before deciding to perform it and consider obtaining certification or training if available. We need to approach informed consent in a different way because now we have to include our level of expertise as a surgeon with this um, new technique. And we may feel very comfortable obtaining informed consent on a procedure that we've done hundreds or even thousands of times, but to discuss a new procedure, we must disclose that to our patients. And we also need to disclose if a mentor will be involved in the case as well. Remember, informed consent is a dialogue. It's an assessment of the patient competence to decide, to make decisions about their care, to disclose relevant information, to assess the, then the patient's comprehension of what you've said, and then affirmatively obtain that consent from the patient or surrogate. It occurs long before anybody signs anything, and it is not equal to a signature on a document. I find that it's very helpful to have others around because patients do not remember what we say. They only remember at best 50% of informed consent discussions on average. It's important to encourage the patient to ask questions, repeat facts back to you, to understand this is not a cure, um, and especially in glaucoma care. Send printed material home with the patient, uh, lead them to appropriate websites, and encourage a family member to take part in this discussion. Sometimes family members aren't present, especially with COVID. We don't allow family members back into exam rooms yet. We're starting to, but not yet. And nor are they often present um, in the pre-op area. But I have found that this is um, really important. And so I, sometimes I have to take time and call family members so that they understand what's going on as well, especially if I feel that a patient um, doesn't understand um, a significant part of what I'm telling them. Um, we must not misrepresent the service that's performed. Um, we must not appropriately alter the medical record. We must have truthful, accurate description of our procedures, giving the patient the perception that newer um, necessarily doesn't mean better. I also wanna mention conflicts of interest as we incorporate these new procedures into our practices. And a conflict of interest exists when 
we, when our professional judgment concerning the well being of the patient um, has a chance of being influenced by other interests. And we must disclose conflicts of interest um, in our communications to the patient, the public, and our colleagues. And the most important part of this is recognizing what can influence treatment recommendations. Um, our, we have a desire to perform these new procedures, um, but we have to be careful in the perceived superiority to current procedures is new or better. It may take less surgical time, have easier post-operative management, faster um, visual recovery, but is it really better? Um, potential financial benefit, our ability to perform more surgeries in less time, um, does it have a marketing advantage over competitors? What about cost effectiveness versus efficacy? I put in the term there, MEGS, instead of minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, um, the term minimally effective glaucoma surgery um, comes about. Um, are we really helping our patients? Is it what they need? Uh, and in terms of effectiveness of lowering pressure, um, there's a great cost to many of these procedures. And is it really going to help them get off of medications? Uh, and is there true benefit? Now that we don't have extensive long-term studies yet, it may be an issue that we don't know the answer to these questions. We have desires sometimes to be seen as innovators or leaders in our field with increased notoriety and giving presentations at outside um, uh, societies. And are, is that really appropriate? Is that why we're doing a procedure? As we generate data for presentations or publications, be aware you must have IRB approval if you're going to present this as research. There's really no shortcuts. You just need to sit down, learn how to do the actual skills via surgical simulation or videos. Um, it's important to emphasize the role of a mentor, anesthetic choice, and patient selection. Other considerations include financial incentives, disclosing additional costs to the patient, um, discussing alternatives. Um, how is post-operative care going to be different? And if one is co-managing with um, an optometrist, are there issues in terms of teaching them what the new issues are in terms of post-operative management? And we'll talk about advertising claims here in just a moment. Let's get back to our gentleman with open angle glaucoma on two medications with um, moderate control of his uh, disease with stable um, optic nerves and visual fields for five years. Is this a perfect case? Perhaps so. You've, you've established long rapport with this patient. Could it decrease his medical burden or, and or achieve lower pressure? Certainly that's possible. Um, he has ideal anatomy and a stable disease and informed consent will be the answer, the ultimate answer to that question. So I wanna to touch upon uh, uh, ethical and legal advertising. Um, of course, this may um, be an important point as our residents are um, moving on in uh, just a short period of time and maybe joining a practice who um, participate in advertising. So I want to emphasize rule 13, communications to the public, which um, goes along with sections five and 12 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Um, the Federal Trade Commission did review rule 13 when the uh, um, code of ethics was first initiated. Uh, and um, I won't say it approved it, but it did review it. Uh, we have to be very careful um, to not step on uh, the toes of those who are um, advertising. No false deceptive or misleading information, no deceptive omissions. You cannot appeal to a patient's anxiety. Um, you must not create unjustified expectations of results. We must, not, we must disclose the risks um, and not misrepresent our own credentials. No unsubstantiated claims of superiority. And this is specific in terms of uh, claims that uh, state that studies show or clinical research proves, you have to be able to show explicitly what those claims are. Um, you cannot say that there are these nonspecific claims of medically proven or implied claims like 
throw away your glasses as in LASIK surgery. Just like I can't say throw away your eye drops with glaucoma surgery. Um, this applies to all claims that we must be able to substantiate um, and that these are objective facts with competent, reliable science, not anecdotal or uh, exaggeration of what we do. Avoiding terms like safe, pioneer, leader, world famous, easy, painless, bloodless, free, guaranteeing results. These are all words to avoid. In addition, in terms of testimonials, state laws may vary. Um, in some states, it is illegal or restricted to provide testimonials in advertising. And you must convey typical, not ideal results. Uh, and you must disclaim that all do not achieve the same results and include alternatives as well. So it's very important to check the state of your practice. So don't rely on marketing materials that are provided by the device manufacturers as it's very easy to irresponsibly market a new technology. Unless you have data to support your claim, don't promote the new technology as providing better visual outcomes or IOP outcomes. And instead of specifically advertising a new technology, try reinforcing that the practice is up to date on the newest technology. And finally, it's very important to seek experienced marketing advice. You are responsible for all ads that are in your name and you could be at risk for ethics scrutiny, FTC scrutiny, and even potential civil litigation. Approximately half of the challenges that come to the ethics committee are advertising related. And because and I alluded to this earlier, because of antitrust and restraint of of trade concerns, our committee is careful when we review these challenges. We can't tell someone to not advertise or in any way to, to discourage truthful advertising. And we can offer resources and guidance about how to advertise without false being false, deceptive, or misleading. So now I want to uh, turn uh, a bit and take a look at a glaucoma minimally invasive uh, surgical device called the SciPass. So I'm gonna tell a story about SciPass. So once upon a time, there was a MIGS named SciPass. It was a very nice and effective MIGS. It was a very safe MIGS, or was it? So a SciPass is a supraciliary micro stent. And this stent is injected into the supraciliary space that is the space above the ciliary body and choroid. And this area is a potential space. So it can be filled with fluid as in choroidal effusions, which are pathologic, but it can also be a potential space for aqueous humor outflow. And this device has a collar, three retention rings, 64 fenestrations in this um, device, which is just over six millimeters long. And here you can see the device appropriately placed uh, into the, the ciliary space. And you can see the retention ring, uh, excuse me, one retention ring and the collar here. The COMPASS trial was a two-year study um, that compared phaco emulsification with phaco plus the stent. It was a multi-center study with 24 sites in the US, uh, interventional randomized uh, to phaco only or SIPAS and phaco in a one to three ratio. Um, patients had pressures of 21 to 33 at an unmedicated baseline. And the results showed that a 20% pressure reduction um, occurred in 60% of the controls. Yes, IOP does lower um, due to cataract extraction alone um, with 59% uh, medication free and it increased in the SIPAS group to 74% um, with over 20% IOP reduction and 85% medication free. There were no serious adverse events in this two year trial. Subsequently, 
The side pass microstent was approved by the FDA in August of 2016, uh, indicated for use in conjunction with cataract surgery in patients with mild to moderate glaucoma. Two years later, so this was August of 16, and now we're into August of, of 2018, a headline on, on my phone, on everybody's phone, everywhere, Alcon announced a voluntary global market withdrawal of the side pass stent for surgical glaucoma based on the five-year data of the Compass XT long-term safety study, because at five years, the stent group experienced uh, decreased uh, endothelial um, cells compared to the group that underwent cataract surgery alone. And Alcon advised surgeons to immediately cease all further implantation of the device. One of my colleagues was scheduled to place a device that next morning, canceled. Everything was pulled from the shelves in the OR. Um, and it was, um, uh, all, all the unused devices were um, removed and sent back to the manufacturer. So that was September. Um, the FDA safety communication um, recommended that we review Alcon's recommendations for evaluating and managing the stents in patients who had already received them. And they came out with some very vague guidelines about repositioning and trimming or trimming the device. Um, and this statement that it was unknown what would happen to the endothelial cell density over time. Uh, they also recommended for patients to see your doctor as soon as possible um, if you have had this implant placed. Here we are another month later, um, an update uh, from the FDA um, stating that all patients should be evaluated periodically um, using specular microscopy until the rate of cell loss stabilizes and that we should evaluate patients with the side pass stent um, to evaluate the positioning of the device um, under gonioscopic um, evaluation, and that those with two or more rings visible should be evaluated for cell loss and potentially undergo additional surgical intervention based on the endothelial cell density levels. Uh, at that point, um, this was considered a class one recall which represents a situation where there is a reasonable chance that the product will cause serious health problems. So just to review FDA recall categories, um, I didn't know whether class one was good or bad. Well, class one is the highest class, the worst um, possible recall in that significant and immediate danger of death or other serious injury from the use of the product may ensue and that confirmation of the recall compliance is complete and all the items are retrieved and trackable. Class two, there's no immediate danger of death or other serious injury linked to the product. And this is more preventative as the risk is still present. And finally, class three, where there's no immediate or perceived danger, but the items are released and are in violation of FDA regulations. So could this side pass be trouble um, uh, be a boon for glaucose. So these were some other headlines that came up, um, which I thought was very interesting and that glaucose stock surged nearly 35% um, based on this information of the voluntary recall. Um, so there's all sorts of waves that occur after this. Uh, Ascaris um, developed a SIPAS withdrawal task force and recommended the following, patient screening with slit lamp exam and gonioscopy to assess the position of the device and identify if there's any contact with the cornea. Uh, intervention was generally limited to when it was clinically apparent or functionally significant changes occur, and no intervention was likely needed if there was zero to one rings visible. Um, but if two or three rings were visible, um, these patients are at higher risk of endothelial cell loss. Um, they also noted that if quantification is desired, that uh, baseline and follow-up endothelial cell density and pachymetry be performed. And if more than one ring of the device is visible, make consider repositioning, removal, or trimming of the proximal end. Of note, it may be quite difficult after one month of uh, 
uh, presentation with fibrosis and adhesions to the uveal tissue. This device does not just slide out once it's been placed. So show me the data, show me what happened um, to um, result in such a withdrawal. So first of all, just to review the original compass data, and I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, and that there was no statistical difference in the percent of patients who had an endothelial cell loss of greater than 30% through two years of the study. So there's no significant difference here. But now we'll look at some of the Compass XT post-approval extension data. And I seem to have lost my screen here. I'm gonna end the show for a moment. Okay, so there was a statistically significant difference here at the 48 month follow up and the 60 month follow up, and a significant increase in the patients in the SIPAS group with greater than 30% endothelial cell loss at the 48 and 60 month intervals, and an increase in the percent of SIPAS subjects with cell density of less than 1500 cells per square millimeter at these two points. Um, it was actually at three points, the 36, the 48, and the 60. Um, you can see here in the original um, COMPASS study, there was not statistically significant differences. In those subjects with a cell loss of greater than 30%, there was no impact on corneal health except for one subject who did have corneal edema that was observed at 51 months after placement of the device. Um, it was trimmed and the edema is resolved um, at, noted at the 60 uh, month uh, time point. However, um, if you look carefully at those subjects at month 60 who had cell loss of greater than 30%, 70% um, also had less than 1,500 cells, and 16% had less than 1,000 cells. So, but only device position, not age, not baseline endothelial cell density, not the study site, not anything else besides device position was strongly correlated with increased endothelial cell loss. So this is an example of uh, a device that was placed with three rings visible. And here is appropriate placement with the collar and the one ring visible. Uh, this looks at uh, an annual endothelial cell loss rates and a significant increase when there are, when there is more than one ring visible. This percentage here is the endothelial cell loss rate per year. Per the directions of use, again, technique, one ring visible is the optimal position. So in summary, the XT study um, showed that there was a significant difference in endothelial cell loss in the patients who had the side pass stent placed. Um, there were um, no other information could be gleaned from the XT study, except for changes in endothelial cell density. It wasn't designed to look at IOP and there were no other safety endpoints um, that were met. So what about endothelial cell loss with MIGS um, relates to device material, changes in aqueous flow, aqueous reflux flow, um, mechanical positioning, uh, device migration. Um, cataract surgery itself, of course, decreases endothelial cell density. Um, whether this is central as in cataract surgery versus peripheral with a MIGS procedure. Um, it's important to have standardized approaches in clinical trials, and that's probably not the case in, in many clinical trials. And I'd love to hear comments about the reproducibility and reliability, perhaps from some of our cornea colleagues. If you look at traditional glaucoma surgery, we also have endothelial cell loss. I think that this is an important distinction because in these cases, these patients often have very severe disease. So if we're talking about a MIGS procedure in mild disease, a surgical procedure versus someone who has advanced um, severe 
field loss that's undergoing a trabeculectomy or a drainage device, our safety um, uh, tolerability is different in these cases. And here we um, see a review of um, comparisons of endothelial cell loss uh, um, amongst MIGS procedures, but again, relatively short follow-up. Um, CyPass has the longest follow-up um, uh, to date. We still have, we have some additional information on Hydrus now that it's uh, not shown changes in endothelial cell loss. So how do we address complications? Here we have this new technology, we've been appropriately trained, we have the studies and the FDA approval, and now it's pulled off the market. Well, don't panic important to disclose the facts that you know, what we know and what we don't know yet to patients. Safety first, look at it. this as a relative and potential complication, um, depending on the underlying pathology and the documented variations of risk, as we showed with the um, different positioning of the stent. Develop a management plan that's dynamic. It's gonna have to change when new information becomes available and always be attentive to the patient's fears and concerns. Share what you know and tell them what you don't know. But we've been dealing with new technology for decades. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what this is and um, for the sake of time, I'll tell you. This is a Ridley IOL. This was the original IOL first implanted in 1949. We've come a long way took us three more decades to come up with the first FDA approved lenses, which certainly weren't very kind to our corneal endothelium. We're still having class one ophthalmic recalls. Um, this uh, review uh, showed up to two, 2015 recalls that we've had um, for a variety of reasons of ophthalmic devices. And incremental revisions occur very frequently in ophthalmic um, devices after the initial FDA approval. Um, of these, 42% um, uh, were implantable devices and 86% underwent more than one post-market modification. So it's important to understand that many devices undergo extensive revisions um, and labeling changes over time. And our evidence supports that the original approval may be less relevant to newer device models. This is also common in other fields like cardiology, orthopedics, and ENT. So in conclusion, our code of ethics provides important rules of the road for our patient's care. Appropriate informed consent process must take into consideration special issues of new technology, teaching situations, and research. Advertising to the public must be truthful and substantiated without deception or false claims. Our patient safety is first and foremost with the guidance and oversight of medications and devices by the FDA. Uh, again, I uh, turn to the Redmond Ethics Center um, for more information on what I've discussed today, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Outstanding. Carla, thank you very much. A great learning experience for everybody. I'd like to open it up at this time to the chat or um, live questions. Carla, I have a question. Um, my understanding that the standard of care of what we're practicing is actually determined by 50 mile radius of what you're practicing. And my concern being that the expansion of mix devices, which I really applaud to you calling it in max devices, minimally effective devices, which I personally totally agree, uh, may take um, kind of expansion of those devices, may take it as the standard of care in the community. And I feel that I'm pressured to in, use those devices um, in order to satisfy the standard of care. And I haven't heard of any lawsuits, but potentially. And what are your thoughts on that and the thoughts of ethics committee on that? That's a great question because I think we, we have to do what we feel comfortable and appropriate for patients. So 
Um, in terms of it being standard of care, um, I don't think we can absolutely say that makes procedures are standard of care because I think that we all have different ways of um, managing that population of patients with early to moderate disease. Um, I see much more, many more issues that patients with moderate to severe disease underwent a MIGS procedure with failure as one would expect. And the surgeon was unprepared to take the next step. The patient was unprepared to take the next step. And that's where um, the standard of care fell through. So those are more the times that I'm seeing that there are issues with patient management, not that you didn't offer this procedure or you didn't perform this procedure at the time of their cataract surgery. I think you can be less um, responsible or less, um, it's less of an issue to not perform those procedures if they're stable or if you're managing them in other ways. I have patients who are on two medications who are perfectly happy taking two medications. And I talk to them about the option of a MIGS at the time of their cataract extraction. Some say, hey doc, I don't want anything done. I don't want any, anything else done. And that's perfectly acceptable. Understanding that they may need something more down the line. So I think again, it's that consent with the patient and you, you sort of um, mentioned, you didn't quite say it, but if it's out in the in your community, what are the reasons that people are doing these procedures? And I think that leads to issues, as I mentioned before, conflict of interest. Um, there certainly is potential financial gain um, that a surgeon gets more for a procedure that they perform than ordering a medication at the pharmacy. So I, I think it is very patient dependent and very practice dependent. Um, I do MIGS procedures in appropriate patients and I think with appropriate guidelines, um, I actually don't do much insertion of devices um, because I feel like we do still have concerns about the long-term effects of leaving a device in a patient. It's different if it's a tube or an expression, um, but it's more um, you know, what's appropriate for the patient. Carla, I have a question. My name is Crystal Huxley. I'm one of the basic scientists here. My question is more on the development side of things. So it seems to me that these, these problems that were encountered with this device happened years after implantation, right? Is there anything, what would you recommend to people who are in the development pipeline? Now, none of our preclinical work goes for years. Right. It's, is this something that should change to avoid this kind of problem? Or is it just not worth it? Well, I think that part of the problem was that the devices the, um, that, that ran into trouble were those mostly those that were not implanted correctly. So I think it goes to, again, learning those new technologies and doing it exactly right, the way the manufacturer described the placement. So if you didn't have more than one uh, retention ring visible, then I think that we may not have seen this as a result. Now, I, I know the manufacturer is not going to come out to say, and say that, and I don't know that for certain, so don't quote me here. But, that, but if you look at what the risk factor was, it's not necessarily that it was just there in the angle it was that it was not placed correctly. And sometimes it is hard. So I, I did not utilize this device um, myself for a variety of reasons, not because of necessarily concern for the corneal endothelium, but there were some other issues that I was concerned about um, that this potential space would scar and would not be effective long-term. But I think that if we want to use a device, we better use it exactly the way the manufacturer recommends and that the, we may not have run into this issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Carla, what do you, um, I, I imagine you often have residents and fellows with you 
Um, what about a triple consent? Do you ever uh, have multiple people operating on one patient? And what do you tell the patient? So are you referring to two trainees and attending yeah. is triple? Okay. Um, so I, I let them know that this is, you know, that we're going to work together for their surgery. Cause I, I hesitate to say, you know, this, the, the resident will do this and the fellow will do that. And I will do the other. I, I emphasize the fact that I am supervising. I will never leave the room. I will never leave the microscope. I'm scrubbed the entire time and that there may be parts of the procedure that will be performed by the trainees. I do leave that as open. I never have had a patient say, well, who's going to put in the lens implant or who's going to do the actual insertion of the tube? We never get down to those specific because it depends. If it's a tough case for whatever reason, then they may not do as much as what we originally planned. So, but as long as they understand that, that the resident and the fellow are there, and I rarely have them both doing surgery because now our new microscopes only have two heads. Um, so it'll be for one or the other, and that's how I manage it. But I think just to let them know that they're involved. In contrast, we have resident clinics and fellow clinics. There's always attendings that are there in the clinic that help make the decision for the surgery, but I may be the attending who's there for the actual procedure. So I will introduce myself because I'm new to the team in their eyes, and I will say, I'm the glaucoma doctor. I'm going to be there assisting the fellow for the procedure. And, you know, I will, you know, be there to, and I will see you post-operatively as well. So that's sort of a reverse training situation to say that I'm, I'm the new kid here that's going to be assisting the fellow. Because they have, the fellow has rapport with the patient, not me. How do you all handle your teaching situation? Well, I'm gonna chime in, Carla, because I really liked um, your approach with um, uh, retrobulbar anesthesia and peribulbar anesthesia. So I actually teach residents of uh, cataract surgery and there's a couple of things that I learned. So I, uh, I do the peribulbar with, you know, actually technique that I learned at WashU uh, with a short 25 gauge needle and I do it for all cases, my cases, resident cases. Um, it's kind of a standard. Um, I do consent patients to anesthesia, um, and I do give them a choice of topical and general, but I do tell them that um, I feel that this is a safer way that they don't uh, feel the surgery and uh, they cannot see the surgery. Um, and that's my standard for all the patients. Um, I also do a lot of stage uh, performance of the procedure. And I think this is the best way of teaching. Um, it's very hard at the beginning to do the whole case, but for the Just breaking up a little bit. Just breaking up. But talking about a step-by-step -step yeah, approach. Step-by-step. -step. So yes. let it put the lens in one day, Abs let it do the wound. Absolutely. Sort of thing. Yeah. Yes, and far this Oh, go I'm ahead. Okay. I was going to comment oh, about anesthesia. I don't use and that done in other countries where sometimes surgeons. Um... Regina, you're breaking in and out a little bit um, on the ride. We're not getting a full statement. She's not driving. It looks like she's in the passenger seat. Yeah. I not drive. Not <laughs> drove into a tree. Okay. Sorry. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. No. We're gonna carry on for just a minute, maybe till you get to a better spot, Regina. All right, so um, it's one thing we're looking at as far as clinically is how we're redesigning our clinics for our patient care. So we've for a long time had traditional resident clinics and um, which included both their continuity or comprehensive clinics and the subspecialty clinics. Mm -hmm. And back when, before the RVU days, um, we were fee for service and all the, the uninsured and Medicaid patients would end up in the resident clinic and all the insured patients would end up in the quote unquote private clinics. Um, well, we went to an RVU base and there was no reason to continue that for financial gain for the attendings. And moreover, it's just not 
we didn't feel it was great patient care for a patient not to be able to identify with a doctor. Um, so the first thing we did, it was easy to move the subspecialty clinics um, to move all those patients to attending schedules. And the residents just went over to the attendings clinics to follow them that day. Um, we're working on a program for our comprehensive clinics. Um, we've had, of course, we have mentors and, and um, supervisors in that clinic, but they're not really the patient's doctor, right? It could be a different um, supervisor in there one day to the next. If a patient calls in, they don't know who they're talking to. So we're going to try uh, to develop a comprehensive clinic each day of the week where the residents rotate into that clinic. It'll be more akin to teaching a fellow than the traditional teaching of a resident uh, way. And so this is what we're going to try. We think it's potentially could be better. It's tough to break the you know, what you've done, the way I trained, the way you, I'm sure the way you trained and the way most people trained. And um, you can always argue what's better in the long run. But I think all around, this should be, theoretically, this should be better. Um, but this is what we're going to try to do. Yeah, it's, it's hard um, to, to establish that continuity and, and allow the residents to learn. You know, it's, it's yeah. this balance. And uh, we have a, a person in our uh, who's full time actually now in our um, general clinic, our comprehensive clinic for residents. So we have a, a person that's there oh, every day right yeah. now, um, which has been has been wonderful. Um, that's a new thing that we've added probably about two years ago. Um, one other comment just about anesthesia. I virtually do all topical anesthesia, and our residents by the time their third years are doing virtually all topical. There's cases where we'll do subtenons, but um, Dr. Smolyak's comment about my, my use of uh, peribulbar and retrobulbar, I, I can't remember the last time I gave a retrobulbar. So um, the, the residents don't learn that from me. They learn it now from the, the retina folks that still do retrobulbar. So <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, you know, shifted, I would say over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, we've, we've pretty much converted to topical. Outstanding. Well, Carla, really appreciate it. It was an outstanding talk and uh, thought for thought provoking for sure. Um, we enjoyed your conversation with you and your input um, across all the clinical cases, and we will someday get you here in person. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank right. you. Thanks again. Every, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, there will be no uh, um, grand rounds in July or August, and we'll restart in September, the third Friday in September. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Thanks.